All right, episode 109 of Young and Eat. We have a, um, a new guest. We, we're doing it in English. And uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Reza Aslan. I am a writer and scholar of religions and author of the book Zealot, which has just come out uh, in its German translation, Zelot. 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 I've actually, I've actually never heard the term zealot. What, 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 what does zealot mean? Well, in the, in modern English, zealot means a, a kind of a, a fanatic, but that's not what it meant uh, it, 2,000 years ago. And this is actually a book about the historical Jesus and the political and social situation um, of first century Palestine that gave birth to his teachings and his movement. And it's German trans... Reza? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, what, 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 like, what kind of term would we use uh, to describe someone like that today? Like, uh, radical, revolutionary. He was radical. He was a radical. Yeah. Okay. In fact, he was no. so radical that they killed him. Did did they? Who 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 yeah, was? Who are they? Familiar with Jesus, they, they, he died actually. Okay, so he, he didn't, he didn't came back from the dead or something. Well, that's the twist. That's that's the surprise ending. Oh, all right. Uh, let, let, let's start from the beginning. Um, um, tell me about this human being called uh, Jesus. Um, tell me, was he born like 2014 years ago? <laughs> well, he, the, our best guess is that he was born in 4 BC uh, and that uh, he lived in Galilee, which is a province uh, in uh, Israel or ancient Palestine as the Romans refer to it. He was a poor, pious, illiterate, uneducated peasant, uh, a complete marginal nobody in his time. So he, who, go ahead. He, well, he didn't. Get, he, get, he didn't go to school, or uh, couldn't he go to school? Well, well. There were no schools for peasant children in in uh, ancient Palestine. What's a peasant? Uh, well, a peasant is somebody who was so poor that you know that they actually had no social standing whatsoever. He probably lived mostly off the earth. Uh, he probably came from a family of subsistent farmers. Uh, and from what we know, he may have been um, a builder or a or a woodworker. Uh, you know, a kind of day laborer, if you will. You know, one of these guys who basically went around looking for things to fix for a few pennies a day. Oh, really? Like, like, uh, like he, he changed his jobs at a daily basis or something? Well, you know, he was a builder, so he was an artisan. So, you know, basically his job was to go see if anybody needed anything to be built. Right. So, um, you said he was born in Palestine, so he was a Palestinian? <laughs> well, in the first century, uh, the entire sort of wad, the, the sort of wide uh, area of land that makes up modern sort of Lebanon, Syria, uh, Israel, Palestine, parts of Jordan, and parts of the Sinai were all just referred to as Syria Palestinia. So, in other words, just Palestine by the Romans. Okay. That's how the Romans referred to it. The Jews didn't call it Palestine. Uh, the Jews called it Israel, um, uh, or they, they called it by the province, Judea, Galilee, Perea, Idumea. These were different provinces uh, that make up what is now modern-day Israel-Palestine. So uh, did the uh, guy who, uh, like the, the peasant Jesus, uh, did he have a religion back then? Yeah, he was a Jew. He was a, a devout uh, Jew, a follower of the temple religion. Uh, Judaism, of course, was different in Jesus' time than it was today. It was a temple cult. So God actually physically dwelled in a temple in Jerusalem. Really? You could, go, you could go and sort of, you know, be near his presence. But only one guy can actually be in the physical presence of God, and that was the high priest. Uh, of the Jews? Of the Jews, yeah. So, but, but Jesus, Jesus wasn't the high priest. Jesus was about the exact opposite of the high priest. The high priest was the one of the wealthiest men in in Judea. He was 
He came from a long line of rich priestly families. Uh, he was a, a Roman accommodationist. I mean, the, the priestly families and the Roman occupation uh, were very tight in Jesus' time to the point where they were practically one and the same, actually. Cool. So um, tell me about the, the Romans. Um, who were they 2,000 years ago? You know, the Romans 2,000 years ago managed probably the largest empire the world had ever known. Uh, and they were very sophisticated about it, too. They were bloody. They were brutal. Uh, they were certainly bloodthirsty. But they, you know, you don't, you, don't man you don't get the largest empire in the world unless you know how to deal with people. And they really knew how to deal with people. They really knew how to deal with religions. They actually were very sophisticated when it came to religious tolerance. Any subject people was free to worship whatever god they wanted to in whatever temple they wanted to as long as they paid their taxes and their tribute and as long as they sacri made sacrifices on behalf of, of Caesar then the Romans were more than happy to leave you alone unless you rebelled. If you rebelled then they killed you, your god, and they destroyed your temple and that was the end of that. So, the Romans, you, had, so the Romans had kind of a uh, religious freedom? They, they, I mean, a sort of an ancient version of religious freedom, yeah. I mean, a very sophisticated version of it. And especially to the Jews. This is the funny thing about it, is although the Romans occupied ancient Palestine, they were very uh, uh, accommodating to the Jews. They pretty much let the Jews worship how they wanted to. Again, they asked for taxes, they asked for sacrifices, but they gave the Jews a lot of religious freedom. They didn't force the Jews to worship Caesar. They didn't force the Jews to worship any Roman gods. The Jews could worship their god as they saw fit. But apparently it was just not enough for the Jews. They, they, their sense of religiosity refused to allow them to even allow the Romans to be in this land that God set aside just for them and nobody else. So um, what did the Romans believe in back then? Did, did they have a religion? Yeah, I mean, the Romans had a lot of different cults. I mean, the main cult of, of Rome was the cult of Jupiter. Uh, but again, you know, these guys were very, they were very smart. They were very sophisticated. You know, for them, religion was another means of social and political control. L like today? <laughs> yeah, just like today, exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's we learned, get back. We learned a lot from the Romans. Let, let's get back to Jesus. Um, how was his life? Jesus lived in a time in which there was this huge gap between the very rich and the very poor. The very rich managed to essentially marry their fortunes to the Romans, and if you weren't able to do that, you were you know, either a peasant or a slave or a subsistence farmer. Uh, you know, this gap had just grown wider and wider and wider in Jesus' time, which is why you can see him as being really the poorest of the poor. I mean, he was... Uh, socially, economically speaking, he lived just above the slave, the indigent, and the beggar. The village that he came from, Nazareth, was a village of mud and brick huts. I mean, this was a, a village of, of poor peasants. Um, it didn't have a road. It didn't have a school. It didn't have a synagogue. It didn't have a bath. Uh, you know, th th it gives you a sense of just how dirt poor and socially irrelevant Jesus was. But how did he get historically relevant? I mean, that's the sort of the great mystery of it. I mean, despite his position in life, he had this incredible charisma. He had a radical message, a message that no one had ever heard before, a message about the complete reversal of the social order. Um, this was not some, you know, loving, peaceful message about let's all hold hands and, and you know, sing together. Je what Jesus was talking about was a new world order, what he called the kingdom of God, in which the rich and the poor would switch places, in which the hungry and the fed would switch places. Uh, he imagined a world in which the first would become last and the last would become first. This was something that had never been said before, uh, and it was profoundly appealing if you were on the bottom. It was very threatening if you were on the top. So, so uh, uh, was he like the leader of the Occupy movement back then? Like, um, he was rebelling against the top 1% or something? 
Yeah, that's abs- That's exactly right. Yeah, if you if you want a, a modern sort of equivalent of Jesus's movement, yeah, the Occupy movement would be a pretty good way of putting it. I mean, Jesus said, you know, that that the kingdom of God belongs to the poor. That that the rich cannot enter this kingdom. Uh, he said that. Uh, the 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 wealthy will receive their their just desserts. Uh, he said that the the hungry shall be shall be fed and the fed shall go hungry. Those who mourn shall rejoice and those who rejoice shall mourn. I mean, this message of Jesus's was so radical that even today, if he dared to preach it, we'd probably do the same thing to him that we did to him two thousand years ago. Kill him? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a guy who did not believe, belong in any kind of political mainstream. I mean, he was, he had really no compromise when it came to the powerful and the wealthy. He said, as clear as day, it is impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It is more easy for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, which I think we all understand is impossible, than it is for a rich man to enter this new world order that he was describing. So, and uh, the the Roman Empire you describe um, has like a lot of resemblance to Western societies uh, nowadays. You know, income income inequality and all that. So, uh, yeah, deep income inequality uh, plus a brutal military presence, a brutal military occupation. Uh, one, one that, that absolutely had zero tolerance for dissent or rebellion of any kind. Okay, so let, let, let's get back to um, how did he die? Like wh- when, when did they decide, uh, okay, it's time to kill this guy? Well, I mean, here's the funny thing about it is that if you know nothing else about Jesus right. except he was crucified, that that's all you know about Jesus, then you know enough to question the dominant view of Jesus as some kind of pacifistic, turn-the-other-cheek preacher with no concern for the cares of this world. What people don't understand is that crucifixion was a punishment that Rome reserved exclusively for crimes against the state. Crimes like treason or sedition, rebellion, that's the only crime that you could be crucified for. And so if Rome thought that Jesus was enough of a threat to the stability of the state that they hunted him down, tortured him, uh, and, and crucified him, then Jesus was probably a bit more of a troublemaker than, than we all think that he was. Um, so that's really the, the most important thing to understand about how to, how to figure out who Jesus was. The second most important thing to understand about Jesus is that he asked for it. This is the thing about they, Jesus is that he, he asked to be killed. To, to oh yeah, ask to be crucified. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh. I mean, look, Jesus's ministry lasted a very very short time, little less than three years. All of those three years, except for about four or five days, he spent in Galilee, you know, in these sort of backwoods, countryside villages, speaking to poor people, to the illiterate, to peasants, people like himself. He, he started this movement for the poor, by the poor, uh, and he addressed his movement almost exclusively to the poor. He never went into any big cities. He never went to sort of the urban metropolis. He never even went to Judea uh, during his ministry. He stayed just in the sort of country backwoods of Galilee until one day he decided, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, is you know the hotbed. It's where the Roman occupation is housed. It's where the temple priests are. And not only is he going to go to Jerusalem, but he's going to go to Jerusalem in the most provocative way possible. He's going to go to Jerusalem declaring himself to be the king of the Jews. He enters Jerusalem as king, on, mounted on a donkey, the way that a king is supposed to enter Jerusalem, with his disciples singing Hosanna, the king has arrived. The first thing that he does when he gets to Jerusalem is that he cleanses the temple in this violent way. He 
creates a whip of cords and he and his disciples start breaking open all the the cages, housing the animals, they kick over the tables with are, the money changers. Are, are they kicking out the, the highest priest? Well, no, they can't kick out the high priest. They're they're kicking everybody else out. They're cleansing the temple in this in this really act of violence and an act of treason. Okay. Uh, and then immediately after that, he goes into hiding in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, which is a forest. And then, according to the Gospels, the Romans and the high priesthood send an armed posse to arrest him. An, a sword fight breaks out uh, when they come to arrest him. Ultimately. They arrest Jesus. His disciples scatter into the winds. Wait, 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 bring... wait. Jesus was sword fighting? The last thing that Jesus says to his disciples before they go into hiding is, if you do not have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Wow. Every, single, every single story that we have of Jesus' arrest involves a sword fight. Now, the Gospels try to ameliorate that by saying, oh, it's just a very quick sword fight and Jesus puts a stop to it, right. you know, very soon. Right. But that's just apologetics. I mean, the reality is that an armed posse comes to arrest Jesus. Jesus' disciples are also armed. A, a sword fight breaks out and, and afterwards Jesus is arrested and then he is crucified as a rebel against the state. I mean, that, that sounds like a guy who's asking for it. I mean, you know, he he could have just spent the rest of his life in Galilee. No one would have bothered him uh, so preaching I, his message. But he decides to go into, you know, the lion's den and basically, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a suicidal mission. I mean, it really is a form of self-sacrifice at that point. So, uh, I mean, and he basically got what he asked for, right? He got... He got what he asked for. So what 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 happened next? He 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 died on the cross, right? He died on the cross, yeah. And and what happened next? What, what was was the human being Jesus Christ dead, or did he uh, come back at some point? Well, what happens then is it really it, it becomes no longer a matter of history, and it becomes now a matter of faith. You know, according to his disciples. So fair, fair, it's uh, fair, we're in fairy tale territory now. Well, you know, if, if you want to call it fairy tale, you can. I prefer the word myth. The word myth huh? d doesn't mean false uh, at all. Myth just means, you know, stories about gods and goddesses. And this is, this is one of those very important stories that has a truth embedded in it that has very little to do with fact, that has much to do with truth. But the myth is that three days later, he rises from the dead, and his disciples see him rise from the dead. But, but how, I mean, that's clearly impossible. How, how, how did that happen? Like, why, why would they say that? Well, they say that, they said that because they believed it. I mean, here's the thing, is that while the resurrection itself is not a historical event, you can't talk about it in terms of history because it's outside of history, what is a historical fact is that very soon after Jesus died, his disciples claimed to have seen him rise from the dead. Now you can take that for what you want, but the disciples believed that enough that they went to their own deaths, uh, refusing to recant that belief. Uh, they believed it enough that they decided to look at Jesus no longer as a Jewish revolutionary, but as something else, something divine, as God incarnate. And they believed it so much that they started a whole new religion out of it. A religion that had very little to do with Jesus' religion. Jesus was a Jew. But the religion that arises after Jesus' death and the claim of the resurrection becomes something completely new. The largest religion in the world, Christianity. Oh, so um, after Jesus died, his, his friends uh, kept his uh, stories. Um, you know, like they, they talked to others about it. They told them the stories, right? And then, yes. at, and at some point, somebody wrote them down. Yes, much, much later, somebody finally wrote them down. When, when, like, like, what, what, when later? Well, if Jesus two years, was born, two months later, what is? You no, know, I mean, look, if Jesus was born in four BC, and if he died sometime around thirty AD, let's just say, 
then the first gospel, the gospel of Mark was written in 70 AD, so that's 40 years later. The next gospels, the gospels of Matthew and the gospels of Luke, were both written sometime between 90 and 100 AD. Wait, and then the final gospel, the gospel of John, was written sometime between 100 and 120 AD. So the, those so people... So 40, the, yeah, so between 40 and 90 years after Jesus' death so uh, are the four gospels. Did anybody who wrote those Gospels ever uh, meet Jesus? No. That's a very important fact, is that the people who wrote the Gospels were not the original disciples of Jesus. They, the original disciples of Jesus were long dead by the time the Gospels were written. This was the second generation of Christians. This was the generation of Christians that already believed that Jesus was God, and then they wrote their Gospels to prove that belief. That's, that's easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, that's an important thing to understand. I just said something very important about the Gospels. The Gospels are not eyewitness accounts of right. Jesus' actions. They are not even historical uh, accounts. The Gospels are theological arguments, not about what Jesus did, but about who Jesus is. That's a like, like big his, his character. Right. Okay. Who is Jesus is the, is the question that the Gospels try to answer. Not so much what did Jesus do. Okay. So let, let, let's, wait, we have eight minutes left. Uh, let's talk about, um, the, I mean, we, we, you briefly explain what his role in Roman politics was and uh, why he got crucified for it. Um, does Jesus have a role in today's politics uh, in the Western yeah. world? Well, it's funny. I mean, look. 300 years after Jesus' death, the religion that was founded in his name becomes the religion of the empire that he fought against. So in other words, the wait, same wait, empire... Wait, the, the Romans uh, became Christian? Yes, the Roman Empire became Christian. Yeah, wow. 300 years later. Yeah, so the same empire that killed Jesus for rebelling against him accepts him as God, as the only God, 300 years later. Wow. Did, did, What's fascinating is that what that what begins there is this weird sort of transformation from a movement founded against the political powers of his day to a movement that becomes the political power of his day. So and at that moment, Christianity becomes a state religion. And ever since then, Christianity has become something quite different than what I think Jesus would have intended. Uh, you know, it has become a, a religion that is a part of government, certainly here in the United States. I mean, you know, we have this notion of a separation between religion and state, but that's just really talk. That's all that really is. I mean, same here. Our, same here, Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Our laws, our government, our politics, our politicians uh, repeatedly claim to speak for and on behalf of Jesus, what Jesus would want. Wait, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. Why would they do that? Because I talked to Jeremy Scahill uh, in episode 92, and he, talked to, uh, he told me that the, the very last guy, the American people, would ever elect president would be Jesus Christ. Why, why would the politicians uh, speak of it in his name then? If Jesus showed up today, the very same people who claim to speak for him would run the other way. Huh. Uh, Jesus' entire message was about the reversal of the social order, about the poor and the rich switching places. If you tried preaching that message today, Huh. Uh, we would get rid of you as fast as possible. Yeah, well, there is no question about that. Well, I mean, look at Occupy, how they were fought. Yes, they were seen as, as crazy people, uh, as people who don't belong in a rational discussion about politics. Uh, yeah, Jesus, Jesus would be uh, cast aside as a nutcase if he was preaching today what he preached 2,000 years ago. So, um, I mean, I talk to politicians regularly. Um, what do you suggest uh, whenever a politician's, uh, uh, whenever a politician um, 
you know, tries to justify something with uh, Christianity or Jesus, what, 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 what should I ask him? What, what, what should I tell him? Look, the, the point that my book is trying to make is, is this. There is a difference between the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history. They are two different people. The Christ of faith can mean anything you want him to mean. In, in America, Christ is American. He's blonde. He's got blue eyes. You know, he probably speaks with a British accent because that's how we like uh, our Jesus, our, our angels and our Nazis always speak with British accents uh, in, in, in the United States. Uh, in Africa, he's African. In China, he's Chinese. For rich people, Jesus is rich. He loves the rich. For politicians, Jesus is a politician. He doesn't like immigrants, and he doesn't like welfare. Uh, if you live, you know, in a in a uh, a hill in in Guatemala, then Jesus is a, a a migrant worker who takes up arms against his oppressors. Christ for two thousand years has meant whatever you want him to mean. He's an infinitely malleable thing. He can be rich, he can be poor, he can be powerful, he can be powerless, whatever you want. That's, uh, so it's all relative. Yeah, but Jesus, the Jesus of history, is frozen in time. So what I mean to say is, when you get a politician talking about how Jesus wouldn't want the state to give welfare, and Jesus wouldn't want to have, you know, an open immigration policy. What they mean is Christ wouldn't want those things. And whenever a politician, whenever anyone says Christ would want X, Y, and Z, what they are really talking about is themselves. They are, re they are looking at Christ as though they are looking in a mirror because Christ is what you want him to be. Jesus is a problem. He was a problem 2,000 years ago, and he's a problem today. You, 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 you want to know what I mean? Look at the Pope. The Pope is talking about income inequality and how Jesus had a preferential option for the poor. And all these Catholics are saying, oh, the Pope is a Marxist. Well, if the Pope is a Marxist, then so was Jesus. <laughs> So um, uh, we got like two minutes left. Let me uh, get uh, to some questions from the audience. Um, one from Nilo uh, asked, um, "Does Edward Snowden have um, <laughs> have what it takes to be a zealot?" I think. Look, zealotry means that your your ideals are so revolutionary, so radical that you are uncompromising in them. Jesus was a zealot because his belief that the land of Israel was set aside by God for the Jews and no one else was so uncompromising that he was willing to die for it. That's a zealot. Okay. Um, and she asked, are there any parallels in today's uh, time uh, with messiahs and all that? And maybe in the digital era? Is there a messiah? Well, look, I, I think that people are always asking me, oh, what, you know, can you give us a modern equivalent of who Jesus is? And, they, and what they want me to say is Gandhi or you know, Martin Luther King, because these are people who, uh, who claim that Jesus was their, was their inspiration. Oh. And that's true. Jesus was the inspiration for Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. But just because Jesus inspired them doesn't mean Jesus was like them. You have to understand that in Jesus' time, there is no such thing as nonviolent protest. You cannot remove the world's largest, most powerful empire from the Holy Land with a sit-in. That's not how it works. <laughs> If you really want a more, like a modern parallel to Jesus, I guess what I would say is he would be less Martin Luther King and more Malcolm X. And uh, final question from Ebru. Um... Why have you converted twice in your life, uh, and uh, why why do you still believe in religion? Well, you know, when you're a scholar of religions and you study the world's religions for a living, you can't take any one religion all that seriously. 
Because what you know is that religion is nothing more than a language. That's it. It's just a set of symbols and metaphors that help you define faith. Faith is inexpressible. Faith is indescribable. Faith is absolutely individualistic. Like, like really? love? Is it like right, love? Like love, exactly. If you, the feeling of love requires a language to express it. Same with the feeling of faith. The language to express faith is religion. That's it. And, your language, and the language... Go ahead. And, and your language is the, the language of Islam. That's right. I like the language that Islam uses. But do it, doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that Islam is more right. right. It doesn't mean that Islam is more true. It just means that the symbols and metaphors that Islam provides are symbols and metaphors that I like better. Okay. But, but, but you, you, you've used other languages before? Yes, and in fact, I'm familiar with all the languages. I like them all. I just like the you know language of Islam better. You know the Buddha. The Buddha once said that if you want to draw water, you don't dig six one-foot wells. You dig one six-foot well. <laughs> Islam is my six-foot well. But the Buddha also meant that the water that you're drinking is the water that everybody is drinking from, regardless of their well. And that's something that I understand pretty clearly. That's a, that's a that's an awesome ending. Thanks, Reza. Uh, it's time, to, time for us to close. Uh, thanks for being on the show. I'm gonna um, end the broadcast now, and we we can talk a little bit um, after this. All thanks. right. Thanks for having me. Take care.